They say Darth Sidious was an evil man, a cunning politician, a Sith Lord, and ultimately a psychopath who would stop at nothing to seize power. He would spend his time in office eroding the institutions designed to guard the Republic from tyranny and dictators like himself. Now, from a real politic point of view, where emotions and ideological biases are removed and the subject of morality is irrelevant, one could say that the creation of the Empire was an attempt to truly stabilize the galaxy and bring its chaotic nature under the control of a powerful central government. Whatever limits placed on personal freedoms and political discourse in the long run ensures the preservation of galactic peace. But what ultimately happens with Palpatine's grand plan is another civil war which drags the entire galaxy into a period of great suffering, turmoil, and economic instability. Spurred on specifically by the cruelty of the Imperial military, the people revolted and said no to the Empire. The bureaucracy and corruption of the Republic had simply been replaced by the Empire's own version of bureaucracy and corruption with an addition of Sith-inspired cruelty and madness. And so no, the real politic observer would be wrong about Palpatine's attempt to bring peace to the galaxy, but surprisingly, it's not because of what Palpatine does directly himself, it's because of who Palpatine surrounds himself with. When one is placed in a leadership position, their individual skills um, aren't weighted as much anymore. What really becomes important is their ability to judge other people's skills and hire the right people to become an extension of themselves. Because no matter how much power Palpatine could absorb into his body from children, he still couldn't micromanage everything in his empire. He still needed to delegate. And one of Palpatine's favorite underlings wasn't a Sith Lord or even a Force user. It was the sickly looking man from the world of Iradu named Wilhuff Tarkin. Where other people saw a relatively unhinged and unpleasant monster with a murderous nature thinly disguised in an officer's uniform, Emperor Palpatine saw a kindred spirit. Now Palpatine met Tarkin back when he was a young officer in the judicial forces. Palpatine himself was just the senator from Naboo at that time. Palpatine immediately recognized that Tarkin was a ruthless killer who was constantly paranoid about those around him and ready to snap necks. This, of course, stems back to Tarkin's very traumatic childhood and upbringing. You see, the Tarkin clan was famous on the world of Iradu and known for taming the wild planet and turning it into a successful hub for commerce in the Outer Rim. In order to maintain a similar level of ruthlessness in their bloodline, all Tarkin males at a young age are sent into a wildlife reserve owned by the family with nothing more than a small survival knife. Tarkin was supposed to survive for several days in this environment, which was populated by gigantic man-eating predators that look like alien tigers and lions. Some might call this child endangerment or abuse, but a Sith Lord like Emperor Palpatine saw it as a great way to get weakness from one's bloodline. Sidious would take Tarkin underneath his wing. The young officer from Uradu would join a select few individuals like Anakin Skywalker, Wraith Senor, and Thrawn, who would act as close confidants to Palpatine and be placed in charge of some of the Empire's most important projects and missions. But upon closer inspection, Tarkin is found severely lacking, especially during his Imperial military career. Not only does he fail Palpatine on several occasions, he might be the main reason why the Empire failed in its grand ambition in the first place. In today's video, we'll be taking a look at some of Tarkin's greatest failures and how they negatively affected the Empire. Tarkin's service during the Clone Wars was relatively unremarkable. He was captured early on in the war and sent to the infamous Citadel prison where he was rescued by a Jedi-led task force. Eventually, he would be promoted to adjunct general and become a key player in the Strategic Advisor Cell's Special Weapons Group, one of the main bodies in charge of developing the Death Star. For the most part, this was Tarkin's role. He would be assigned to overwatch important Republic military projects and report back to Palpatine. Shortly after Order 66, Tarkin was promoted to the newly made Imperial position of Governor. He would be placed in charge with re-evaluating the Clone Trooper program to see if it would be a good fit for the new Imperial military. Now, a lot of noise was made about how Palpatine didn't trust the clones, especially after seeing how efficient Order 66 was carried out, but let's not forget that Palpatine orchestrated the whole plan himself. I think the real reason why the clone army was retired was because of the astronomical costs associated with it. And then the second reason would be Tarkin's own evaluation of the clones. He, like many, despised the clone troopers and saw them as nothing more than biological robots. He, however, was impressed by Clone Force 99's combat abilities and tried to test their loyalty, which of course turned them against the Empire. 
Tarkin was one of the best recruiters for the Rebel Alliance by far. And that's because he had a very abrasive way of doing things. But ultimately, Tarkin's greatest mistake was having Admiral Rampart, his underling, destroy Typica City and all of the cloning facilities on the world. The Kaminoans were in a league of their own when it came to understanding cloning technology, a technology that Emperor Palpatine would have depended on greatly later on in his life to keep himself alive. The true value of the Kaminoan cloning uh, industry was not just all of the raw material and research they did, but the actual scientists and researchers themselves. But of course, after Tarkin blows up Typica City, I doubt they're going to want to help the Empire at all. The reason why Tarkin destroys Typica City is because of his black and white view of the world. Tarkin believed that everyone was like him, either trying to seek power or trying to take it from others. Tarkin didn't understand that you could create mutually beneficial business deals with other parties, like, I don't know, Krennic or the Kaminoans. And so he employed brutal strategies that were supposed to instill fear into the hearts of others. But Tarkin's brutality led to just two things. One was increased recruitment for the Rebel Alliance, and two, the destruction of a very useful infrastructure. In 18 BBY, Tarkin was assigned a mission to secure Mon Cala's allegiance by Emperor Palpatine, or pacify it if they refuse. Tarkin arrives over the planet with his Star Destroyer of the Sovereign. While Vader and a bunch of Inquisitors arrive to scope out the situation on the ground, after an Imperial diplomat is killed in a mysterious accident, Tarkin's forces commence an attack on the watery world without any investigation or understanding of what had happened. Tarkin immediately assumes that the Mon Cala have attacked the Imperial Ambassador. To make matters worse, his military force is not equipped for underwater battles. What Tarkin should have done was just maintain a blockade in orbit. Instead, Tarkin attempts to invade the watery planet, and as a result, the Mon Cala Mercantile fleet managed to escape the planet, including the Profundity, flagship of the fleet at the Battle of Scare for the Rebels. Eventually, it was uncovered that a rogue Jedi had planted the bomb to assassinate the Imperial diplomats. And so the Mon Cala were actually not looking to fight the Empire. They wanted to stay neutral. But what Tarkin does here by attacking their planet was create another enemy, an enemy that would build the foundation of the Rebel Alliance. <laughs> Named after the ancestral lands that the Tarkins used for their sick coming-of-age tradition, the Carrion Spike was also the name of Tarkin's personal ship. This needle-shaped corvette finds its roots in the Clone Wars in the IPv2C stealth corvette. This was a vessel with some of the most advanced stealth technology in the world built into it. Not only was it invisible to scanners and radar, the ship was also invisible to the naked eye. The Carrion Spike also had these same abilities, which makes it a perfect ship for someone who wants to travel around the galaxy in secret, like, say, a bunch of former Republic Intel officers. And so while on a routine mission on Mirkana, that's exactly what happens to Tarkin's ship. It gets stolen by a former Republic Intel officer known as Birch Teller. He would use the Carrion Spike to carry out numerous raids against Imperial facilities across the galaxy. And there was really no way for the Empire to track them unless they could use a force user like Darth Vader. So yeah, you can add uh, loss, a stealth ship to the Rebels to Tarkin's long list of mistakes. Back when Palpatine first met Tarkin, uh, the Senator, back when Palpatine first met Tarkin, the Senator actually suggested that he get into politics himself. Yes, this completely malaligned individual who is very paranoid and has very uh, toxic views of the world would make a great public servant within the Empire. Tarkin would actually be appointed as governor of the Outer Rim Sector in the early days of the Empire. This territory included the planet of Lothal, a newly important Imperial world that had just uncovered massive mineral and metal deposits crucial to the war effort. Instead of properly developing the site with a long-term sustainable business plan, Tarkin begins evicting farmers and essentially stealing their land. He would then relocate these individuals to resettlement camps, which became known as Tarkin Towns. It seemed like wherever Tarkin went, the local populace would get really angry and join the rebellion. And as a result of his heavy-handed measures, that's exactly what would end up happening. The forces that Tarkin sent to Lothal would eventually be defeated and the planets would be liberated by the Rebel Alliance, cutting off a key source of Dunium for the Imperial Navy. In 
Imperial class Star Destroyers were around a mile long and had tens of thousands of crew members on board. These ships were many times the size of even the largest ocean-going vessels in our own world. Simply put, these large vessels were extremely expensive to build and maintain and even more difficult to destroy. We love Tarkin's personal Star Destroyer, the Sovereign, would accompany him on many missions and was a source of pride for the Empire. Remember, Wolof Tarkin developed the Tarkin Doctrine. This was a military doctrine that believed that the only way to create stability in the galaxy was by instilling fear on the entire population. Tarkin correctly assumed that there were too many planets in the galaxy to pacify through sheer military might. But he also wrongfully believed that by showing the Empire's power through devastating weapons like the Star Destroyer, that the Rebels would just capitulate in the face of such overwhelming odds. Again, Tarkin has zero idea how normal people function. He probably viewed people with normal emotions with disgust and wanted to get into knife fights with them. Tarkin would eventually come to Lothal himself and he would bring the Southern with him. He was searching for a Jedi who was leading a very stubborn resistance movement against the local Imperial garrison. Tarkin would use the Grand Inquisitor to capture the Jedi known as Kanan Jars, but the Jedi would not only defeat the Grand Inquisitor, the Darksiders' blade would fall directly into the Sovereign's reactor, causing a chain reaction that would destroy this extremely priceless vessel. Luckily, Tarkin would escape the ensuing explosion. Now, Tarkin takes credit for the Death Star project, but this super weapon is really the work of dozens of different Republican later Imperial agencies, all under the guidance of Director Orson Krennic. Tarkin had quietly watched Krennic develop the super laser until it actually became a real thing. And when the moment presented itself, he would do a hostile takeover. Again, instead of rewarding someone like Krennic for pulling off what was a very difficult construction project, Tarkin just wants all the glory for himself. But there's a throwaway battle going on here. Not only is Krennic and Tarkin fighting against each other, the Rebel Alliance are also quickly closing in and trying to steal the planets of the Death Star so that they could figure out the main weakness of the battle station. Tarkin and Krennic should have figured out where the leak came from, and that way they would have a better way to understand what exactly the Rebellion were after. Perhaps they could even prepare Scarif for an attack. This doesn't happen, of course, and so Tarkin was late to arrive on Scarif when the Rebels did attack, and by the time he opened fire and destroyed the majority of the Imperial installation on Scarif, it was already too late. The Rebels had escaped with the Death Star plans. This was a ridiculously stupid move on Tarkin's part, he does kill Orson Krennic along the way, but he's once again shown no regard for Imperial life and has destroyed an entire archive of important information just to protect the Death Star. The Rebel victory at the Battle of Yavin wasn't the result of Luke's skill or even his luck. It was more because of Tarkin's incompetence and foolishness. Even though the Rebels were only able to scramble a few X-Wings and Y-Wings to attack the Death Star, Tarkin should have still scrambled the fighters immediately upon entering the Yavin system. The Death Star's main weapon takes a while to actually fire up, and the turbo lasers on the surface of the station are designed for slower and larger targets. Having TIE Fighters ready to go after you re-enter real space is a really big deal because they can help screen your battle station from enemy fighters. And as big as the Death Star was, as impervious as it was to conventional weapon, it still cost a lot of money to repair the armor or installation on the surface of this battle station. On top of that, these fighters can chase down any rebels attempting to flee the system, but instead Tarkin allows the X-Wings and Y-Wings to fly directly into the Death Star's own gravitational field and begin their attack runs. They manage to even take out a few turbo laser platforms, which are far more expensive than a few TIE fighters. To make matters even worse, Imperial Intelligence informs Tarkin that there might be a weak spot on the Death Star that the rebels are targeting. Instead of gathering more forces to defend the reactor's vents, Tarkin just ignores the intel. As a result, Luke Skywalker manages the impossible and launches a proton torpedo into the Death Star's main reactor and destroys everything. So as you can see, Tarkin was one of the biggest reasons why the Empire failed. He single-handedly was responsible for the recruitment of so many rebels, and we didn't even talk about how he destroyed Alderaan. This actually led to the single largest defection of Imperial forces to the Rebellion, this, this one action. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.